<laughs> the Lord be with you. All right. Um, we're in a uh, uh, prophecy of Isaiah. If you need a Bibles, uh, uh, oh, okay, there you go. Um, we're in uh, chapter 34, and we've been uh, working our way slowly but surely through this uh, This really uh, the, the, the most major of the major prophets, uh, uh, Isaiah for sure, is for sure. Um, in uh, chapter 34, uh, you know, we, last time uh, we, we in the previous chapter, uh, 33, uh, we had a glimpse of the new heaven and the new earth with an untroubled Jerusalem, which certainly in Isaiah's day, there was plenty of trouble and there's still plenty of trouble in Jerusalem now. Uh, and we, uh, you know, Isaiah had a vision of the Lord in his uh, unshakable temple in Zion. And uh, said how all oh, uh, NIV is seven oh eight page seven oh eight. Oh, that might help. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. Oh, thank you, Ruby. Isaiah seven page seven oh zero eight seven seven oh eight. Yeah, I think is that the top of that? Is that the NIV? It it is. Okay, I think it would be the same. Yeah, page seven. Let's see. It's all right. Here we go. Thank you. Sure. And so um, the last chapter ended up with uh, Isaiah having visions of um, from the Lord of, about uh, things that were outside of his present day situation. Uh, and uh, this chapter is uh, is is no different. Uh, it's a lot like the apocalypse uh, that we uh, of Isaiah that we studied earlier. It begins with wrath of God and ends with joy and singing. And that's why I kind of have titled these next two chapters, which are really pretty closely linked: uh, the wasteland and the oasis, because it begins with judgment and ends with redemption and glory. And the prophecies of the day of the Lord always kind of seem to go in that fashion and uh and uh, the first two verses of isaiah 34 um it reads um god's calling for everybody's attention come near you nations and listen pay attention you peoples let the earth hear and all that is in it the world and all that comes out of it the lord is angry with all the nations his wrath is upon their armies he will totally destroy them he will give them over to slaughter. Um, you know, in the last chapter, uh, we heard this same sort of declaration. Hear those of you who are far off what I have done. You who are near, acknowledge my might. Um, and in the last chapter, it dealt a good bit with the holiness of God. Uh, and uh, it, is, uh, the, uh, it is the unholiness of uh, of mankind that has kindled the wrath of God, uh, uh, and uh, of course He sought to um, to Jesus came as an appeasement to that wrath, uh, because He came to make us holy. Uh, but uh, there are many who uh, who have rejected Him, and um, and so in a, the uh, the unholiness of, uh, of of mankind is an assault. Uh, and an affront against God and his uh, His goodness and his glory. Man, uh, kind of paraphrasing the Apostle Paul uh, and, uh, and unrighteousness uh, and ungodliness. Uh, uh, many kind of suppressed the truth about God, his goodness and his glory, uh, denied the knowledge of him and that we're his creatures and that he is the creator, uh, refused to honor him as God, and have failed to give thanks to him. And so because of this uh, disobedience and betrayal, verse 2 says uh, he will totally destroy them. Now this is destroy them apart from the remnant. Uh, we This theme that carries all the way through Isaiah of how God will preserve a remnant of his people uh, and, uh, and through all the ages uh, to, to bring them to, to himself and in his kingdom. 
And what follows in Isaiah 34 is a, a series of uh, rather vivid and uh, somewhat visceral apocalyptic uh, imagery uh, about God's wrath being poured out upon the earth. Uh, I get a volunteer for verses uh, three through eight by any chance. Okay, thank you, thank you, Julianne. The slain will be thrown out, their dead bodies will send up a stench. The mountains will be soaked with their blood. All the stars of heaven will be dissolved, and the sky rolled up like a scroll. All the starry hosts will fail, and withered leaves, like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. Fig tree. My sword has drunk its fill from the in the heavens. See the sun being taken on the heavens. The people I have totally destroyed. The sword of the Lord is bathed in blood. It is covered with fat. The blood of lambs and goats, fat from the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in Edom, and the wild oxen will fail them, fail with them, and bull, the bull calves and the great bulls, their land will be drenched with blood, and the dust will be soaked with fat. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of tribulation to uphold Zion's cause, Edom's streams will be turned into pitch, her dust into burning sulfur, her land will become blazing pitch. Okay, that that's good, Julie. Thank you. That's perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, uh, it's tough stuff to read uh, in the Bible. It really is, uh, and uh, you know, uh, this is. Uh, um, you know, but uh, Isaiah, as well as telling us of the great redemption and the grace that God wants to show through the uh, Redeemer, is also uh, having been called uh, by God in the temple the way he was, uh, is also acutely aware of, of God's holiness uh, and uh, uh, his, uh, his zeal against, uh, against sin and the fact that, uh, um, you know, uh, as so we quoted that from Peter, uh, how he said, uh, the Lord is not slow, as some think of slowness. Uh, he's just uh, patient, wanting uh, uh, everyone to come to, uh, to repentance. Uh, and uh, But uh, as, as we see, many don't come to repentance. And this um, uh, day of vengeance that uh, Julianne has described for us in, ra in rather graphic terms, this year of retribution to uphold Zion's cause, like I said in verse 8, um, is, is what's described. And uh, although it may have a reference, of course, to, to the Zion and the Jerusalem of, uh, of Isaiah's day, I think it also uh, has also to mean uh, the heavenly Zion, uh, the abode of God. It's often referred to, uh, God refers to his uh, His abode in heaven as Zion. And uh, so, uh, the and, and, and this is, you know, this is uh, uh, by his command, it, it's all in the terms of a sacrifice. Uh, you know, uh, the, you know, this idea of the, the fat and the blood of lambs and goats and so forth. Uh, the, the the sacrificial uh, offerings that are described in the in the uh, in the Pentateuch uh, are are kind of in view here. Uh, although this is like a, a universal uh, sort of sacrifice, and uh, uh, it's uh, God unsheathing the uh, two-edged sword of His wrath that comes from His command of His mouth, uh, and that's a fearful day. And um, in, in verse four, uh, Julianne described. Uh, uh, astronomical phenomenon, uh, the skies rolling up, the stars are dissolving. Uh, this this is almost exactly what Jesus uh, uh, describes in the Olivet Discourse uh, from Matthew 24. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, 
The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give us light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. As Jesus describes it himself, using imagery not unlike that of Isaiah. And the image of God as a warrior is not what we we usually care to think of very often, but uh, it's not unique. Uh, it's, uh, it, we find it elsewhere in scripture. Of course, Moses uh, wrote this in the, in the song of Moses. Uh, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. His horse and the horse and his rider, he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in power. Your right hand shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury, and it consumes them like stubble. And uh, that's Old Testament. Uh, New Testament, uh, we find it very similar in the, uh, in the Apostle uh, John's uh, revelation uh, in chapter 19. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems. He has a name written that, that is known to no one but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. That, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and his thigh, he has a name written. You remember this one, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Um, and so, you know, uh, we don't think of God in the sense of the warrior, but certainly uh, there is a, 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 a spiritual warfare going on. Uh, boy, all of our contacts with the mission field uh, that we hear over and over again uh, from when we were down in Cuba, uh, when David Witt was here just the other week, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in India and South America and so forth. Uh, there's genuine spiritual warfare. There's genuine evil being uh, uh, against the persecuted church. And um, and so, uh, you know, in a sense, I guess we uh, have been enlisted as, uh, as God's soldiers uh, in his war against uh, the works of the devil. And that's uh, why we need the whole armor of God as de described in Ephesians 6. Um it um, what was mentioned uh, in, in what uh, what Julianne read there uh, in verses uh, I guess it was six and uh, nine uh, about Edom and Basra. Well, you know Basra is a city in Edom, uh, and Edom was a a, um, a uh, town in 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 Edom uh, that was uh, to the east of Judah. And these were the perennial adversaries of of Israel. Um, the uh, I think it's not really as much that uh, Edom itself is being singled out here, uh, but uh, that it is a a sort of a type uh, of all of God's enemies and adversaries in the world uh, because they perennially perennially uh, oppose God and they opposed and persecuted God's people. Uh, and uh, I mean, it, it, it describes an almost Sodom and Gomorrah sounding destruction about uh, burning sulfur and blazing pitch uh, in, um, in verse nine. Um, and uh, those following verses uh, says, uh, uh, it's smoke uh, will, will be uh, not be quenched uh, night and day. Smoke will rise forever. Uh, from generation to generation, it will lie desolate. Uh, verse 11, the desert owl and the screech owl will uh, possess it. Uh, their, uh, her nobles, verse 12, uh, there 
uh, have, will have nothing to call a kingdom. All of her princes will vanish and thorns uh, will overrun her citadels, nettles and brambles her strongholds, and she will become a haunt for jackals and a home for owls. You know, this is described, remember I said the wasteland, uh, you know, this this is the wasteland. This is the, the Judea, it sounds like the Judean desert. Uh, you know, we drove through it in a nice air-conditioned bus when I was there, but uh, I didn't have a chance to get out there and experience the, uh, uh, but it was a... Uh, Where is Edom? Uh, Edom is just uh, south of the Dead Sea, uh, directly to the east of uh, the, uh, the, the uh, tribal possession of the land of Judah. So it would be the southern, just east of the southern part of Israel. Um, and Edom no longer exists. <laughs> it kind of in, right, it's not, in, in fulfillment it's of this prophecy. Still is there, but somebody else. There, yeah. Yes, I think it would probably be Jordan, uh, uh, wow. modern day Jordan. Yeah, and um, so um, this this is a. Uh, is it between the uh, Salt Sea? But well, I'm looking at my old. Uh, yeah. And north of the, um, the what is that the Red Sea line? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's north of the uh, Arabian Desert, uh, and uh, and um, I should have called up my maps. I don't have them. Well, we lost. We used to have maps, and they came across here. <laughs> Our lost maps. I know we've looked all over for them. Yeah, it helps to see where things were. Yeah, but it's really just at the southern end, uh, the southeast end of the Dead Sea, uh, uh, to to the end of that. Um, and it's really kind of very, it is very desolate country. There's not very much that can uh, uh, survive out there in that desert. You didn't see hardly anything green at all. Uh, even the uh, vegetation was brown. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, it, it's, a, it's the uh, habitat of owls and hyenas. Uh, and uh, the uh, Edomites were... Uh, were con are condemned in uh, Psalm 137 for rejoicing over the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, so uh, they were, uh, um, uh, you know, um, they were, uh, or I guess that's one of the reasons they're being singled out here. And speaking of the, 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 uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, you know, the door, Lord's Day of Vengeance, as we've already come across uh, right. in Isaiah, throughout Isaiah, uh, it, it would, uh, Israel was not going to be exempt. Uh, the unrepentant souls in Judah and Jerusalem uh, would experience God's Day of Vengeance and His retribution. Uh, you know, way back when, uh, before uh, almost um, seven or eight hundred years before Isaiah, uh, when uh, Moses uh, uh, was leading Israel, um, God gave him this uh, uh, um, this uh, commandment uh, regarding the covenant, uh, and this has become the sad legacy of, uh, of 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 the people of Israel. I'm afraid, uh, it's from Leviticus in, in verse four, 26, uh, verse 14. But if you will not listen to me, and will not do all these commandments, if you spurn my statutes, if your soul abhors my rules so that you will not do my commandments but break my covenant, then I will do this to you. I myself will discipline you sevenfold for your sins. I will destroy your high places and cut down your incense altars and cast your dead bodies upon the dead bodies of your idols. My soul will abhor you. And I will lay your cities waste. I will make your sanctuaries desolate. And I will not sp smell the pleasing aromas of your offerings. And I myself will devastate the land so that your enemies who settle in it shall be appalled. And I shall scatter you among the nations. And I will unsheathe the sword after you. And your land shall become a desolation. And your cities shall become a waste. Now, it um, those words that sound a lot like what Isaiah has just described, and uh, in the last chapter uh, 
uh, we, we were reminded how the, uh, the, the sinners in Zion, as they're called in, in uh, Isaiah 33, 14, had become complacent. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was all of these, uh, the, the way, you know, we're, we're coming to view all of these invaders uh, and hostile uh, adversaries that were coming against uh, um, uh, Israel were in God's sovereignty, uh, his discipline uh, against the nation. And because of his, uh, um, you know, his grace toward them, uh, their persistent disobedience would bring uh, the Lord's vengeance and his punishment. So. It does look like that with verse 8, for the Lord has a day of vengeance, a day, a year of retribution, retribution to uphold Zion's cause. Mm -hmm. It does look like this is not only inclusive of other nations other than Israel, but exclusively other nations other than this is only the non-Israelis that are that are referenced here that have all of this evil. Well, okay, not a, it can't be evil if it's of God, but all of this retribution against them is that is that accurate? That this is just other other nations other than Israel. Uh, well, like I was, I was just uh, the portion I just read was actually addressed to Israel, right. and so the but, seems to be the other nation. Yeah, and this is this is I think what I was saying that the, the uh, upholding Zion's cause right. is more uh, in, in terms of the heavenly Zion. If you look, right. uh, if you, we do a word study, we find where God refers to His throne in heaven as Zion. Uh, often and um, so the, the theme throughout Isaiah has been that uh, God is going to preserve a remnant uh, and th that word is used precisely uh, a remnant of his people uh, and that remnant uh, Israel really was a remnant within the world uh, of all of God's people but even within Israel uh, as uh, there's uh, we, we've come across already uh, there's a remnant within Israel there's an unfaithful Israel uh, there's, uh, Paul says all who were born of Israel are not Israel uh, you know it uh, the the, uh, the true circumcision is the circumcision of the heart uh, and uh, it's those with the circumcised heart and then we see uh, how God has also uh, left a door open for the uh, for the other nations uh, for a remnant to be preserved there. Well, is it happening during Isaiah's day? I think this is clearly a looking forward to the messianic era uh, when uh, when God is already uh, gathering a remnant from the rest of the world. You know, from uh, as we we are a class that uh, that's uh, really. Um, has a lot to do with the mission field. Uh, we we support uh, uh, three or four missions here uh, out of our uh, our class donations and stuff, and, uh, and join with the church on that. Our church does this as well. But um, I think that's that, that's that makes up that whole remnant. And this is an interesting thing when you study a prophet. Sometimes he's looking both now and then, then he's looking at not yet. Uh, and so you get this vision and, and sometimes sorting uh, sorting out which time frame reference he's, he, uh, he, he's working from uh, can be a little challenging. And uh, uh, so I, I think uh, this idea of, of this day of vengeance uh, is looking toward a final day of vengeance for Zion's cause when, when all of God's remnant will be delivered into chapter 35, which we're getting ready to, to see. Uh, and, but the ones who... Uh, who are not of the remnant, who have rejected uh, God's offer of grace in Christ, uh, will evidently experience uh, this uh, awful uh, scenario that's described uh, in chapter 34. I hope that helps. <laughs> like you said, the messianic aspect of this is that this, the end game is, is the ending of this world's system, uh, at least from the, from the current. And setting up the millennial reign of Christ. Yes. A perfect reign. It would be totally just, which uh, uh, would be like, a, uh, in a sense, a prelude to, to a bookend to the Garden of Eden, which lives, human lives would be 
very long and that uh, and that there will be peace. So, uh, you know, we talked talk about that last week with the untroubled, unshakable tabernacle uh, uh, and how, you know, the uh, how the tabernacle of David's orders has a has a, a reach outside of uh, of uh, j just the one in Jerusalem. There has to be a shaking of what currently is bringing about the end. Yeah. That's what's being, being, being talked about. Final, the final crescendo of that. The, the heavenly uh, Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, uh, is the other end of that bookend. Yes, good, Mike. Thank you, Mike. And so, all this desolation. I said there was an oasis coming. I, I did say that, didn't I? No, didn't. All right. Let me read the first two verses of Isaiah thirty-five. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and of Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord. The splendor <laughs> of our God. I have a little multimedia here for you. So see it Hallelujah. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, the glory of the Lord uh, shall be revealed and all flesh will see it together. Uh, actually, those words come precisely from Isaiah 40, but uh, I think we find them right here in Isaiah 35. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, they will see the glory of the Lord and the splendor of our God. Um, this is... Uh, uh, what a contrast uh, to what we just have considered. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, I think, 
the 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 glory in uh, in uh, George Frederick Handel's uh, music uh, uh, re reflects uh, the uh, the the majesty and the beauty uh, uh, that uh, we ultimately uh, is the hope that sustains us uh, uh, in these days in the wasteland. Because uh, let's face it, uh, some of the things uh, described in chapter thirty four are going on right now. Uh, and uh, we uh, we it's that uh, that hope and yes uh, we do live uh, with our eyes fixed not on what is seen but on what is unseen. What is seen is temporary and what is unseen is permanent. Uh, and uh, that's uh, that's where we'll be going uh, next week. It looks like, <laughs> but uh, I wanted to at least get to the glory of the Lord here. Uh, this uh, this beautiful description. Uh, uh, about uh, about uh, the revelation of the, uh, and the renewal of nature uh, in the first two verses there is something I really want to spend a, a moment on just because uh, I have an old book. I think, did you find it for me or who did? It was called uh, The Plants of the Bible. <laughs> yes, you want me. This old, old uh, thing by a lady named Winifred Walker. And uh, there's a plant mentioned in those uh, first two verses uh, uh, that ought to uh, amplify the definition of God's glory being revealed. And so uh, we'll pick up there uh, uh, next week. Uh, let's, uh, let's close the word of prayer. Dear Lord, uh, we uh, thank you that uh, uh, in, in Christ we have the light of the knowledge of the, the glory of God in his face. And uh, let, let, let us never sell that short. Uh, we, we have uh, beheld your glory in, in, uh, by faith in, in the Lord Jesus. Uh, but, but we look forward to that day when, uh, all, that, when all flesh shall see it together and uh, the glory of the Lord shall be uh, revealed once again. And uh, we, uh, uh, we thank you for our, our, our study together today. We thank you for our, our, our new friends that have joined us. Uh, and we just pray a blessing on all those who weren't able to make it today. Uh, and please bring us back together next week to study your holy word. In Jesus' name, amen.